Hello, I'm Kimberly Acosta. Welcome to the Native News Update. It's Friday, April 8th, and many of the stories you hear here can be found at our website, IndianCountryNews.com. And here's the news today from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. The threat of a government shutdown tonight at midnight has American Indian leaders scrambling to determine what the stalemate on Capitol Hill would mean for their reservations, where the federal government's presence often plays a vital role in everything from law enforcement and social services to schools. The looming shutdown would be especially troublesome for tribes that receive such essential services as police and health care directly from federal employees, said Jacqueline Johnson, Pata, executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. Those tribes tend to be the most impoverished and many aren't in the position to make up for the loss of government services. Under the shutdown scenario, dozens of schools that the Bureau of Indian Affairs oversees could be closed, said former BIA Assistant Secretary Carl Artman. Like the last time around, however, a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services official said Indian Health Services, hospitals and clinics on tribal lands would likely see little impact because their services are deemed critical. Many tribes are still assessing likely impacts following tribal council meetings and sessions with staff earlier in the week on how to move forward. A program created to benefit Alaska Native corporations and subsequently their communities should not be rolled back just as it started to have a positive impact, said an advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. Lance Morgan, chairman of the Native American Contractors Association, in testimony before the state's committee, excuse me, in testimony before the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, warned against the elimination of preferences and special rules that benefit the Native Alaskan contractors which have come under fire recently following alleged fraud in the program. Frustratingly, now that some Native Alaskan businesses are finally succeeding, some would use the success to bar the door for to others, he said. The growth of contracts indicates that Native participation in the program is working. Some might have him define working, however. So-called ANCs have come under the fire by enjoying unfretted ability to win contracts and in some cases cheating the system by operating a pass-throughs to companies that don't otherwise qualify for SBA's disadvantaged business program. In response to these type of incidences, Senator Claire McCaskill introduced a measure in November of 2010 that would prevent ANCs from being awarded contracts without proper competition. It would also require ANCs to meet the SBA's definition for disadvantaged businesses rather than earning automatic designation and to include all affiliates and subsidiaries when calculating size for purpose of SBA program eligibility. Spurred by Greater Vallejo Recreation District's plan to create a park along the Glen Cove waterfront in Vallejo, California, Local Native Americans on April 7th disrupted an on-site planning meeting. For years, the 15-acre Glen Cove Park has been a point of contention between Greater Vallejo Recreation District's officials and Native American activists who consider the area a sacred burial, ancestral burial site. During the on-site meeting, County Supervisor Linda Seifert toured the waterfront area with a few Native American activists. She said she was not taking a position. Located along the Carquenez Strait, Glen Cove was an important Native American gathering area for nearly 1,000 years. On April 7th, more than a dozen people fighting to keep the city from doing anything to the waterfront area joined the pre-construction meeting with PG&E representatives, plus planning consultant Randy Anderson from Atlanta Planning Design. Some stood quietly on the peripheral and burned sage, while others asked questions and made statements. Construction on the park will start in the next 10 days. The area will be fenced off and closed to the public. Agricultural Secretary Tom Vilsack announced April 8th that tribal nutrition education projects in 10 states have been selected to receive grants this year through USDA's food distribution program on Indian reservations. The grants will help develop creative, self-initiated projects designed to enhance the nutrition knowledge and to foster positive lifestyle changes of participants in low-income households living on Indian reservations 
into American Indian households residing in approved areas near reservations or in Oklahoma. Janie Hipp, director of USDA's Office of Tribal Relations, joined Governor Bill Anna Tubby and Lieutenant Governor Jefferson Keel of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma to announce the grants on behalf of Agricultural Secretary Tom Vilsack. We are committed to working with tribal nations to improve the nutrition and health on Indian reservations and tribal lands, Vilsack said. These projects will help support and expand nutrition education through self-initiated projects and provide better access to more fruits and vegetables so that we can make great strides in improving the nutrition and health of tribal members. USDA chose 15 applicants located in California, Kansas, Minnesota, Mississippi, Montana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Washington, and Wisconsin to receive fiscal year 2011 funding to develop nutritional education projects that incorporate the dietary guidelines within the Native American culture. The University of Massachusetts Amherst community is celebrating Margaret Peggy Spees, professor of linguistics, as a 2011 Spotlight Scholar in recognition of her 20 years of work to preserve North American native languages, in particular the Navajo. Spees is a founding member of the Navajo Language Academy, a nonprofit group formed in the 1970s to promote research and teaching of the Navajo language. She did much of the legwork for their incorporation in a history served continuously on the board, including two years as president. The Academy has hosted Na Navajo linguistic workshops for language teachers and scholars every summer since 1997. This year, Spees was nominated by her peers as a Spotlight Scholar for her research, creative achievements, and contributions in her field. Spees has co-taught at NLA's annual summer workshops that gather Navajo language teachers to share ideas about teaching and studying the intricacies of Navajo grammar. Additionally, Spees worked with Evangeline Parsons Yazi, a native speaker and professor of Navajo at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, on an introductory Navajo language textbook that was since been honored as the official textbook of New Mexico by former Governor Bill Richardson. A team of five American Indian Science and Engineering Society students from the Madison Metropolitan School District in Madison, Wisconsin is the champion of the first annual Intertribal Middle School Science Bowl held in New Mexico. The Science Bowl brought together teams of American Indian, Alaska Native, and First Nation students in grades 6th through 8th to compete in fast-paced competitive format that tested students' knowledge in all areas of math and science. The 10 teams from eight states across the nation competed against each other over two days. The Madison Metropolitan School District students went undefeated to finish alone in first place. The team is made up of students from three Madison Metropolitan School District middle schools and five tribal nations. The winners now go on to Washington, D.C. to compete in the National Science Bowl, which will take place on April 27th through May 2nd. Students will also compete in a hydrogen fuel cell car competition. On March 25th, following a year of film festival showcases across the globe, the movie Some Days Are Better Than Others held its public premiere in Portland, Oregon, where the movie was mostly filmed. Renee Roman Nose, a 47-year-old part-time actress, is one of the key cast members in the movie. Roman Nose, who lives on the Tulalip Reservation, just north of Seattle, gained much of her experience as a performer through live theater and as a radio DJ. Roman Nose's character, Camille, a socially isolated thrift store employee, was originally written as a minor figure in the movie. But when casting director Simon Max Hill and director Matt McCormick saw Roman Nose's take on the character, they not only pegged her for the role, but they rewrote the script to expand Camille's presence in the film. The part meant a lot to me, Roman Nose said. Matt said I brought an emotional depth to the role that he had, hadn't expected and that Camille is the only complete storyline from beginning to end in the whole film. Camille's story is interwoven with the two of the other main characters played by Carrie Brownstein and James Mercer. The story is a sometimes sober but revealing look at what we value in life and how we cope with the harsh reality suggested by the movie's title. 
MMA fighter Virgil Swicker, a Chumash from Southern California, has another opportunity to shine under the Strike Force banner on the preliminary card of the April 9th Diaz vs. Daly event. While he's contemplating a shift to light heavyweight, this contest will take place in the heavyweight division as Swicker will step into the cage with Brett Albee, who has a record of 3-0. and Growing up on the Chumash Reservation in Southern California, Swicker and his family had very little in the the way of material possessions, but they had one another. It's a time that Swicker looks back on fondly, even if it was also a time in which he had began to head down the wrong path. Swicker is proud of his Native American heritage and his ability to represent his people inside the cage. He cites Dan Hornbuckle as one of his favorite fighters and lists veteran Wachim Spirit Wolf as a good friend. Swicker doesn't just chalk up his accomplishments inside the cage as a day's work when it comes to representing his people. He gives back to the reservation communities in other significant ways. In addition to motivational speaking, he mentors teenagers as a basketball coach in the Intertribal Sports League. While a win over LB on Saturday night will be a huge for Zwicker, he has already scored the biggest victory of his life outside the cage by escaping his own personal demons and seeking to provide a more positive example for the next generation of Native Americans. And that's the latest roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me and have a grand day.